Say they may agree and they may disagree, or they may agree to disagree. We don't know. So for the first time, we're gonna we're gonna listen to what they have to say. But if you've come here with preformed opinions, you're not going to get much out of this. So I want you to to take some time and be very open-minded. Nobody is here to insult anybody's theories or destroy the fact if somebody says UFOs don't exist, then that's their opinion. Uh, now, we're going to have uh, pairs of speakers. We were, going, we were originally going to have three, but unfortunately one came down with a medical problem uh, from Australia, so there's only going to be two pairs. So uh, did you all receive your uh, program changes? Okay, so uh, my good friend uh, Horace Drew, uh, the geneticist from Australia, won't be making it, and unfortunately Bill Burns uh, won't be here. But we have uh, two individuals to uh, take their place, and uh, what they're going to say is going to be very uh, illuminating. Now, I, I want to make an announcement uh, that um, Vicki uh, Jack, Victoria Jack, is here. Are you in the room, Vicki, yet? Okay, not yet. All right, she, she is here at the conference, and Victoria puts on the uh, super uh, spectacular San Francisco Bay Area UFO Expo uh, every year, and this year the dates will be September the 27th and 28th. And, uh, you know, if you make a, a reservation in advance, if you live in the Bay Area or not in the Bay Area, it uh, gets pretty packed. I believe there was 1,500 people there last year. So she puts on a, an excellent conference. Uh, I'll be there uh, as a speaker. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I, won't, I won't have to be uh, you know, dedicating the time that uh, I have uh, put in this one. I'm not the conference organizer. I'm not responsible for anything except getting the speakers here and the program. So if you see me running around here trying to uh, help with technical problems, of which I know absolutely nothing about, uh, it's just because I, you know, I, uh, I want to lend a hand. Now, uh, another uh, thing that I have to ask of you, if you will, uh, you're perfectly free to uh, take pictures and uh, record whatever you want, except during the time Dr. John Alexander is going to be talking, please don't have any recording equipment of any kind. No video recording, no audio recording. We're going to be looking around the audience during the time that he's seeing and uh, if we see somebody trying to record, unfortunately, we're going to have to uh, remove that person and take the recorder and get it back when, you, uh, when this lecture is over. But I'm asking you to do that in, in deference for Dr. Alexander uh, because he has uh, quite a history. And believe me, there's reasons for everything that happens uh, here today. So uh, we'll get uh, right into it. Uh, our first two uh, speakers are basically going to uh, talk on the subject of uh, Planet X. And we have uh, Mr. Jason Martell here, uh, who has been uh, talking about uh, Planet X uh, for some time. As a matter of fact, 15 years. Uh, Jason is one of the leading researchers and lecturers uh, specializing in ancient civilization technologies. Uh, Mr. Martell's research has been uh, featured worldwide on numerous television and radio networks such as the Discovery Channel, History Channel, Sci-Fi, BBC, and many others. Uh, most recently, uh, Mr. Martell garnered worldwide attention by recreating a working uh, model of one of science's most prolific mysteries, the Baghdad Battery, which you probably know about. Residing, uh, this resides in the uh, National Museum in Iraq. The discovery of this 2,000-year-old device suggests that modern-day battery was not invented in 1800 by Count Alessandro Volt, but was invented almost two centuries earlier. Uh, Mr. Martel's recreation was instrumental in proving the Baghdad battery was capable of generating current. Uh, lecturing throughout the world, Mr. Martell has dedicated his studies to ancient artifacts and the Sumerian culture by using the latest in scientific research, 
supporting evidence and data. He corroborates his findings with principal scholars such as Zachariah Sitchin, naval astronomer Dr. Robert Harrington. Uh, Mr. Martell holds regular discussions with NASA scientists on the subject of Planet X, ancient astronauts, and structures on Mars. Uh, there's um, great uh, evidence uh, that has shown that uh, in our solar system, uh, uh, the planet uh, Nibiru uh, passes through our uh, solar system and uh, I think that uh, if you listen to what he has to say uh, and you know a little about this subject or you know a lot about it, you're going to be very well informed. And uh, with uh, uh, Jason, we're going to have Dr. Tom Van Flanderen, who is a worldwide known astronomer. And uh, Tom received his Ph.D. degree in astronomy specializing in celestial mechanics, the theory of orbits from Yale University in 1969. He spent 21 years uh, at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., where he became the chief of celestial mechanics branch of the Nautical Almanac Office. During the uh, past deca decade, Tom has been a research associate at the University of Maryland Physics Department in College Park, Maryland, and is a consultant uh, to the Army Research Laboratory in uh, Delphi, Maryland, working on improving the accuracy of the global positioning system. And, you know, everybody that drives a car now knows what a global positioning system is. He and his wife moved to uh, Seguin, Seguin, I guess that's the way you pronounce it, in 2005 to be near their children and grandchildren, enjoy the, uh, enjoying the beauty of the Pacific Northwest. In uh, 1991, Tom helped form an astronomy research organization, uh, Meta Research, uh, to foster inquiry into worthy ideas otherwise supported solely because they conflict with mainstream theories in astronomy. Among the organization's significant contributions are evidence against the Big Bang Theory and a better theory for the origin and nature of the universe, experimental evidence that gravity propagates much faster than light and a new model for the origin and nature of gravity itself. The prediction of asteroid and comet satellites years before their discovery, new evidence favoring the exploded planet hypothesis and new models for the origin of asteroids, comets, and the solar system. Strong hints that certain anomalies seen on Mars are not natural origin. So uh, we've got two uh, really uh, fantastic speakers here and uh, I, I've let the, the paired speakers uh, kind of choose their own way that they're going to do this. So what's going to happen is that the, the first speaker, who is going to be uh, Jason Martell, is going to talk for 50 minutes. And then Tom will come up and talk to 50 minutes. That will leave 20 minutes in which they'll both be up here together to do whatever it is they want to do. Throw bananas at each other or answer questions or run out the door. So uh, now uh, it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce my very dear friend, Jason Martell. Let's put your hands together. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, give me a second here to flip on my laptop. I was joking around earlier. I said I call my PC my personal computer. Okay, looks like I'm good. Hopefully my little clicker here is going to cooperate as well. Perfect. Okay. Thank you for coming to my lecture. Today I'm going to be discussing, as Roger eloquently put it, Planet X. And what I'm going to be focusing on is also some of the ancient connections through biblical ties to ancient languages and texts and artifacts that also tie in the idea that there could be another large body in our solar system which has some pretty interesting effects, not only on our planetary orbits, but possible other civilizations or beings that could be influencing our societies that are in our own solar system. 
So what I'm going to do is kind of start off with some of the modern research for a term that's called the search for Planet X. Now, this is kind of a modern term, Planet X, symbolically meaning X unknown, but 10 also beyond Pluto, the next planet out there found. And there's been a plethora of research over the last decade for the idea of another body in our solar system beyond Pluto and research to suggest that we should still be looking out there beyond for another planet that does exist. So there has been uh, a massive amount of research that's been done over the last, let's say, 20 years that kind of suggests the idea that there is another body in our solar system. This is a diagram that's actually from an Encyclopedia Britannica and it shows uh, from in the early 80s they actually had plotted that there's a dead star, a failed sun, way out in the solar system. And I'll get to that in a minute, the idea that our solar systems could possibly be binary. But here it is in even a, in a 1983 uh, diagram that shows that the orbit of our sun could also incorporate another failed sun that has a planet orbiting around it. Let me grab my laser pointer here, too. Okay. This way I can point things out to you guys on the screen here. So this would be the idea of they're saying that there's another sun out there that, that exists. And so all throughout the modern research in the last 10 years, we've had things coming up uh, in the news or new types of uh, instrumentation being launched into space, uh, infrared equipment, things that can penetrate the cold veils of space and do fine tuning to get a better idea of what's out there. A lot of the satellites that they've released over the last few years have a very interesting uh, connection or correlation to the idea of looking for large bodies in our solar system. This is one of the uh, satellites that was deployed. It had its own mission to uh, carry out some primary science, but for whatever reason couldn't do it, and so they re-engineered this to be a planet finder. And so there's a lot of these types of satellites and instrumentation in space to start to look for other types of bodies that we didn't quite recognize through the astronomical community. The whole idea that a planet could have an elliptical orbit, be on an orbit like this, was something kind of unknown to science. And it took quite a while, even until the time of when Hubble first imaged uh, a planet around another sun. Now this isn't our sun, uh, and this isn't you know our solar system, but this, this planet had an egg-shaped orbit around its star, and that was very interesting to astronomers because that was one of the first times they'd actually seen a planet that had an elliptical orbit, more of like an egg-shaped, elongated orbit. So many of the telescopes that we've launched have uh, an unbelievable array of sensory on there to start to look for you know, what we would call extrasolar planets or failed suns, brown dwarfs, and basically what we're doing is launching satellites that are kept out in, in space at super cooled temperatures below freezing. And what they're able to do is penetrate these deep layers of dust and debris that we couldn't penetrate before. And now we get a much clearer infrared image of what's going on deep, deep in space. This is a satellite that we had launched just recently called CERTIF. It was renamed to Spitzer after a famous, uh, I believe it was an astronomer. Um, so this is one of the latest packages that we have in space to detect you know, large bodies within our solar system or, you know, uh, very far out in the solar system as well. Or not in the solar system, but just way far out in space. It's, you know, we're talking about three-dimensional space, so there's many areas that you can look at. And the more of these uh, types of packages we can deploy, the better our chances are for finding some type of, you know, uh, another body in our solar system. So here's just a, a, a digital rend rendition of sort of in space, and it would have it would take up its own orbit around our Earth, I believe, or around the Sun in, in, in a similar fashion as Earth and just kind of go around in its own gravitational pull. So some of the data that CERTIF has been pulling out already, it's, it, it's only been up there less than a year, and the, the clarity of what they've been able to extract is quite amazing. If you look here, this is just normal visible light, and under the CERTIF, you can see that they were, actually this is normal visible light, and under the CERTIF's infrared technology, you can see the these are all little planets or you know, stars uh, within this uh, galaxy here. So there's, there's a much more amount of detail being uh, displayed with our advances in, in science and technology. And you can see here, this is just like a mo mosaic of the galactic center where, again, you can see just so much activity that we're able to view now. These could be possibly all little stars with you know, planets around them. So it's pretty interesting that there's uh, you know, a lot more data that we're able to extract 
as we go further and further with our technology improvements and being able to pull out instead of megabytes or gigabytes, now it's terabytes a second that's being downloaded. So this is just kind of a diagram that explains the general idea that here's a Jupiter-sized planet, here's our sun. We have all these things in between, brown dwarfs, white dwarfs, failed suns, that are kind of becoming uh, in the almanac of, of planetary science for what are the objects are, that are out there in space and that we could possibly classify them as. This is a, an interesting instrument that's a ground-based telescope in Hawaii, the Keck Inferometer. And what it does is it basically has two independent telescopes that will focus in on one point in space and be able to create a much more detailed three-dimensional picture of the object that they're looking at. It's a very cool telescope. So there's been uh, a plethora of news releases stating the idea that, hey, some astronomer somewhere is reigniting the idea that there is something in our solar system that deserves further study. There's evidence to suggest that there's some large body that maybe has caused effects in the past, and we'll discuss some of those, or could be incorporated into our planetary model now to say, yes, there's you know, another large body out there. So we've seen all kinds of news releases coming out in the media for the idea of a tenth planet. And this, this information really kind of kick-started in the 80s with the telescope, the Infrared Astronomical Satellite. And this was basically one of the first infrared telescopes that turned on and instantly was able to see this whole new vast array of planetoids and planets and failed suns and all these things floating around out there in space that they really weren't e ever able to actually pinpoint. So the, the, where this gets kind of interesting is there is a, a, another scholar, um, not connected to the astronomical community so much, but just as an independent author and researcher, this gentleman, Zachariah Sitchin, met with the lead astronomer for the Naval Observatory, Dr. Robert Harrington, and very interestingly shared uh, a similar pattern for the idea of a, another body in our solar system. Now, Dr. Harrington, through the Naval Observatory, had plotted that there should be another planet coming out through the ecliptic, southern ecliptic plane and would have a long, elongated orbit. Uh, and be a part of our solar system. And this could explain some of the or orbital perturbations of the outer planets, why maybe Uranus was tilted on its side, maybe possibly some of the moons of the outer planets, or the outer planets, Pluto, Neptune, these might have, might have been like uh, possible moons of Saturn that got di dislodged and were put into the orbit that it's currently at. So Dr. Harrington had a very interesting model which suggested the idea that there's another planet in our solar system. Now where it gets interesting is Zachariah Sitchin, uh, he's 84 and has been studying ancient languages, Hebrew Bible, the Christian Bible, the origins of biblical texts for about 50 years. And in his research, he came across a term called Nibiru. And Nibiru meant planet of the crossing. And it was a planet talked, by, talked about by an ancient culture, the Sumerians, the first culture we have record of on Earth. And they describe this very large planet in our solar system. They accurately cite all the other planets in our solar system. So this kind of started to raise the, eye the eyebrows of certain researchers to start to correlate the ancient information of this large planet and what effects it could have caused, maybe causing a great flood, cracking off the ice sheet and instantly raising the water levels 300 feet around the world. Hmm. So the correlation between a planet X and the idea of a Nibiru took on an interesting twist when we can see that the planetary models for, for Nibiru has an elongated orbit and the, the NASA model for a planet X also has a very elongated orbit. So they share their ideas and it was a very interesting uh, note to have for the first time modern science try to start to confirm ancient knowledge. So here's Dr. Robert uh, Harrington and basically a lot of his information and the star charts uh, and things that he had, he had plotted where he thought this planet X would be sighted are still available in the uh, Harvard Astronomical Abstracts and you can download these and other astronomers could look at them and start with his research and kind of go along that lines. Now, since Dr. Robert Harrington's research, um, there's been a lot of new ways to look for the idea of a, a, an extrasolar planet. And originally he had thought that there were, there were perturbations, as the term was used, in the, on the outer planets. The planets seemed like they were being pulled in a certain way, so Dr. Harrington suggested there could be another large body causing these influences. We don't quite use the perturbation method anymore, and I'm sure Tom, Dr. Tom Van Flanner will be able to fill us in on some of this, but there's a whole new array of you know, planet finding that they don't actually use just solely math anymore to look at the perturbations and wobbles of the planets. So most recently, uh, you know, just actually last month, 
uh, a very interesting astronomer named uh, Dr. Takashi Mukai out of Kobe University in Japan released, wouldn't you know it, an orbital model for a very highly elliptical or, uh, planet uh, that's a part of our solar system. So every time one of these uh, mainstream, mainstream astronomers comes out and, and, and prognosticates the idea that there is another body in our solar system or this type of research deserves more study, the mainstream science is quickly to be like, oh, no, this, it's not there, it couldn't be. And where I have a discrepancy is that all the things that they've been citing for a planet X in the last 10 years, Sedna, Quoar, Xena, no. These are all little ice balls floating around out there. The planet we're talking about, cited by the ancient cultures as well that does exist, is four to eight times the size of Earth. Big planet. Not something you can miss and not something that's going to be a little floating ice ball beyond Pluto. So if we do find this planet, it'll be very interesting to collaborate with a lot of these findings that have been happening and coming out over the years here. And just recently, I think the date on this article here is uh, August 12th or something, but you know, uh, large planet X may lie beyond, may lurk beyond Pluto. So this research is, is still mainstream cutting edge right now for the idea that it's uh, pushing the envelope of astronomy and, and trying to pierce through the veil of understandings that, you know, they wanted to try and demote Pluto to not being a planet. Well, why don't we just stick to what we have and, and kind of be a little bit more open-minded to the idea that not everything we think uh, is in place is. So where this turns for my uh, personal interest is the fact that, again, what I'm going to now show you is there's a bunch of ancient knowledge coming from sources that can be verified, artifacts, tablets, and things that we have evidence from uh, ancient cultures that are very astute astronomically that tell us there's another planet in our solar system. And not only is there another planet in our solar system, but there's beings that live on that planet. So there's a very uh, infamous author, author named Zachariah Sitchin. He's wrote a series of books called The Earth Chronicles. Over 50 years of research. Um, Zachariah Sitchin's a linguist. Um, studies ancient languages, was, is, is one of about 220 people in the world that can actually translate Sune uh, Sumerian cuneiform script directly. And so he's wrote a series of books mainly focusing on the Sumerian uh, legacy of information and how that it's filtered into all the other cultures. Now, why Zachariah Sitchin really caught my attention with archaeology and, and ancient cultures, all the other linguists or archaeologists out there will focus on one artifact or the linguists will focus on one word, the Nephilim, the Anunnaki. But they don't put it into a bigger context of what it all means. What, what, what are they doing? What does this mean? And so there's always going to be discrepancies in the mainstream community for the accepted explanations or uh, definitions of a lot of the things I'm going to show you. Now, the reason why I stick with Sitchin is because he puts it in an overall context. He's not just debating the word Nephilim. He's putting into an overall context of what they were, what they meant, and it's not just in one language, it spans many languages. So what I'm going to do is focus on one culture specifically, kind of where all this originally started, and that's Sumer, modern day Iraq. Uh, 6,000 years ago, we have a culture that comes up right out of the Stone Age called Sumer. Eventually it became Mesopotamia, Babylon, and it's today's Iraq. So this fertile strip of land here called Mesopotamia, right between the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, has some very interesting properties for the artifacts that we've been pulling out. Now, in the late 1800s, uh, a, a, a person with the British Museum was doing excavations. Most of the artifacts that have been found in Iraq are all stored in the British Museum. And uh, you can you know, visit them there and see it. He pulled out a tablet, which I'll show you here in a minute. He pulled out a tablet that uh, in stone on this ancient cuneiform script. Again, this is 1890 around there. It starts to talk about how a Sumerian god chose a Sumerian man in cuneiform script, mind you, a 6,000-year-old stone tablet, to build an ark, to build a big boat because there's going to be a flood. There's going to be a great excess of water as their planet comes by. So there's this Sumerian tale, which literally word for word is the Noah's Ark tale, but it's 2,000 years removed from the time of the Hebrew God of Abraham or any time, you know, of Jesus and like a Noah in that time frame in the Christian Bible. This is a Sumerian tale that's 2,000 years removed from any other version of a biblical Noah's Ark tale. So it could be, for all intents and purposes, the original. So in a lot of these other stone tablets that discuss biblical tales, which we can find an iteration of a biblical tale in the Sumerian form, unchanged in stone, have a lot of 
parallels to modern biblical tales. Things about Genesis. Uh, uh, the Bible talks about a time when there were giants upon the earth. Well, the Sumerians talked about living amongst their beings or their gods, the Anunnaki. They said that they lived amongst these beings and had day-to-day -day interactions with them. So a lot of the things that they recorded on these things, which this here is a, it's basically a stone tablet. They used something that was a round stone cylinder seal and it had a reverse carved imprint, like a reverse image. And then we'd roll this positive image over wet clay, leaving, uh, leaving the imprint and would fire in a kelm, making it in stone. So they left us hundreds of thousands of these, of these tablets, which show all types of various uh, pieces of information. And uh, this one, you can see here, actually has a little description uh, from, the, from, from the British Museum describing like what, what you're seeing here. And what's interesting is that if you look here real closely, you'll see these seven dots, and you'll see this winged disc here in a little crescent shape. These are all astronomical symbols. Now, in the British Museum, these seven dots are being represented as the seven sisters of Pleiades, the Pleiades constellation. Sitchin says, no, that's not Pleiades. That's Earth. The seven dots representing Earth, because we are on the seventh planet. When the Anunnaki came here, they said, you're on the seventh planet. I'll show you what I mean here in a second. So if you look at all the planets here, if you're starting at you know, Pluto and you go in, you count. <coughs> one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Key, the sacred number seven, seven days in a week. Seven tablets of creation, seven days of Genesis. The Sumerians were told by the Anunnaki, when we came into your solar system, you were on the seventh planet. Now, the hip term we hear is the third rock from the sun, you know, but no. Actually, coming into our solar system, Earth, one, two, three, four, five, six, is the seventh planet. So a lot of this information comes out from the Sumerian details about astronomical pieces of our solar system, the distance between the planets, what the planets look like in space. And we can test this information because over time we've sent probes out there, Galileo and Voyager, and they took measurements of the outer planets for the first time seeing the planets in color and sure enough they match the Sumerian descriptions from 6,000 years ago of Mosh Sieg, Uranus being a, a greenish blue planet. They had accurate descriptions of the distance between the planets. But where the discrepancy came up is that you see in, in the early 1900s we're pulling out Sumerian tablets talking about outer planets and the distance between the planets. Pluto wasn't discovered until 1930. So in the early 1900s, all these things about Anunnaki, these winged beings, what kind of look like angels, or distance between the planets, was all thrown into a big myth pile and left untouched, basically, by modern astronomy and sciences. So a lot of the information that starts to kind of raise the eyebrow, just from a layman's point of view about the Sumerian information, is that we know that from the time of Copernicus and Galileo, man thought that we were the center of the universe, that basically we, you know, everything orbited us until we became smart enough to realize that that's not the case, that we orbit the sun. Well, interestingly enough, the Sumerians noted our, our, our planet structure correctly on a tablet that's 6,000 years old. Here you have a, 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 a scene where the god is granting to man the plow, modern agriculture. But as a backdrop to this cylinder seal, you see here a complete monitor of our solar system with the sun in the center and all the little planets that we know of correctly displayed. Now how could they know that the sun was in the center of the solar, uh, in the center of the solar system? We, we, we didn't know this until we started using mathematical calculations and you know, telescopes to say, wow, we actually are orbiting the sun. So they had this down correctly right out of the Stone Age. Who taught them? How did they know this? Here's an interesting tablet. Another thing is uh, that th they didn't think the ancient people were familiar with the shape of an ellipse, like a wheel. Here it is, a circular tablet. Now, interestingly enough, on this tablet, this little portion here, even though it's badly damaged, this little portion alone was translated by Zachariah Sitchin, and you can see it has some very interesting information. What it translates to basically talk about is the path that the Anunnaki god Enil took to get from Nibiru to Earth, and he would have to make course corrections. So here, the term for this was Nibiru. Uh, you can see the lists here the names of the planets. And it talks about here, when God Enel went by the planets. Um, you can even see here on the side, the text is like rocket, rocket, mountain, mountain, pile up, high, high, high. What is this doing in a 6,000-year-old culture? So a lot of the other things that they, they left us that we can pinpoint to say, wow, they are on it. 
They left us astronomical information in texts, sacred texts that were handed down over hundreds of years. They could predict on what day, 50 years in advance, a lunar eclipse was going to take place. They tracked the orbit of planets over hundreds of years and followed their orbits in the sky. So they were very astute astronomers. And the information that they tell us about another planet in our solar system, beings living on this planet, our science hasn't yet been able to confirm that. But after one or two or a hundred coincidences, which I'm going to show you here, you have to start to wonder, like, well, wait a minute, you know, what's really going on? How could they have known all this information? Uh, this one, again, just uh, shows documentation of observation of the stars over hundreds of years, just showing you just various tablets. These are stored in the British Museum, some are in Turkey. This one, uh, just a various you know, Sumerian, Sumerian cuneiform script, sometimes also done on precious stones or, or like granite. Uh, but you can see the detail of some of these things. It's very interesting. Now, this one is a very interesting uh, seal because you can see here in the sky there's a glowing cross or there's a cross depicted in the sky. Now, that's the actual symbol the Sumerians described for Nibiru. Nibiru stood for planet of the crossing and they symbolized this very early on as a glowing cross in the sky of where their gods came from way before Christianity and Jesus on the cross. So they actually had little descriptions and cylinder seals to denote Nibiru. Now, originally, Nibiru was in the form of a cross, and here's a cylinder seal imprint. This is from uh, Zachariah Sitchin's books from the Earth Chronicles. And you can see here they're plowing a field, the sun, and in daylight they're looking up at awe at that glowing cross in the sky. The glowing cross eventually is transversed into other cultures as the winged disc. And we can see this showing up, and you know, I don't know what this means here, but I understand the symbology being shown. Through Sitchin's research, what we're looking at here is Earth, the seven dots of Earth, and its crescent moon, and Nibiru, a glowing cross. So that's a, a symbolic seal that they were using, and you'll see these symbols over and over again for the representations of the planets, uh, th the idea that uh, the heavens were divided up into 12 parts, the zodiac, that's a Sumerian first, the divisional of the heavens into 12 parts. So a lot of this information and the math that's displayed, we'll talk about that number 12 too in a minute, is just very interesting. This tablet I find just uh, unbelievable. It's basically telling a uh, part of a story, a much longer story of an epic of Gilgamesh, and it's a form of the epic of creation that we have in the Bible, like Genesis and the seven days of creation. Well, this tells a much more, this is on 11 tablets, and it's a much more detailed understanding and explanation about how Earth came to be and how we show up on Earth. So there is a Sumerian tale in this Epic of Gilgamesh and also in uh, the Enuma Elish, it's another version of the sacred text, that talks about how in the very early on of our solar system, before the planets had become solid masses, another planet appears, and they called it an intruder planet. And they said that this planet was attracted by the inner part of our solar system and got sucked into the inner part of our solar system. And in doing so, when it passed by Jupiter and got by the inner planets, it had this interaction with our now Earth, was then called Tiamat. It didn't hit our planet, but the moon of planet X whacked our primitive Earth, then called Tiamat, so hard, the Sumerians say, that that's what strewed out the asteroid belt, that initial collision, and it put Earth in its new orbit where it is now. So if you look at the solar system model that we have now, and that's the orbit now planet X or, or uh, Nibiru now takes, is a very elliptical orbit around the sun. Um, let me back up for a second. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to note. I think I have a, a model of this in a second, but the, the, the distance between all the planets where they have free room to freely rotate, um, right between Mars and Jupiter, we have the asteroid belt. Now, that strip of where there's just debris, there's clearly enough room for another large planet to have once passed and have an orbit there. So we'll look at that here in a, in a second. But this is another thing that came out in the science a couple of years ago. Uh, I'm not even sure if Tom's familiar with this. Probably is, though, because he's so on top of it. Uh, but, oh, I'm going back. Excuse me. There was another theory that just came out called the Orpheus theory. And there was just some NASA planetary science model to suggest that, let's see if I can get that to play. Forgive me here, folks. My, again, my personal confuser. I'll let that go for a minute. Maybe it's just going to start playing. Um, well, 
Sure. Make it difficult for me. Okay, so this was just another animation, a science model that showed astronomy was predicting that there would be another large planet in our past called Orpheus, and that it passed so close to Earth that on one of its passes, it actually could have had a collision, an impact, and that's what strewed out the fragments that then coalesced to make our moon. Kind of close to Nibiru, kind of close to the idea of what the Sumerians are saying, but I found this a very interesting theory in modern science to suggest a large rogue planet entering our solar system and having dramatic effects. And if there was ever to be a large dramatic event, you can see that Earth uh, being whacked into half a planet would just be kind of a chunk. It wouldn't be a large circular you know, planet like we see now. So a very interesting correlation is the idea that we hear of Pangaea. If Earth was half a planet, originally, like Pangaea states, it would just have been one chunk of, uh, of a land. But, you know, water in its planetary form siphons into a sphere, so the water on our planet just filled in the large gaps in the Pacific Basin. But over time, like the skin of an apple, it's all come undone to be where it is. And we've proven this, that that's, that's possibly the idea, that if you look at all the continents, you know, they seem to fit, that at some point it was all connected. That also supports the idea that Earth was just a half a planet. And then over time, it's become, you know, taken the shape that it is. So just very interesting correlations of the Sumerian information. Here's that diagram I was going to discuss. If you look between here, the orbit, the, the amount of distance for the other planets, there's clearly enough room for another planet to have orbited there. This is an interesting breakdown of math that I show that uh, several years back there were rumors, and of course now they're pinpointing 2012, it's not going to happen, that in 2003 Planet X was going to come back by and kill us or cause these gravitational effects like it has in the past. Well, just from a simple mathematical thing here, you can see a breakdown. We're looking at the initial time when the Sumerians described that this intruder planet got sucked in. It's kind of around the time when the planets had just finished coalescing. That's roughly 4.7 billion years ago. Nibiru grows around the sun roughly once every 3,600 years. The Sumerians actually had a symbol for that. It was called a shar, and they gave the first complete circle as 3,600 uh, years, which also comes down to 360 degrees of the circle, another Sumerian first. But if you just do a simple math saying, okay, it goes around the sun 3,600 years, so 3,600 divided by 4.7 billion, that means that it's been going, it's, it's already orbited through our inner part of the solar system over a million times. So maybe it's not always going to cause gravitational effects when it does pass by. And that's the next question, of course, as everyone's wondering is, Will we see a Nibiru or a Planet X in our lifetime? Maybe some of you saw Comet Hale-Bopp. I did. Trip me out seeing that large comet in the sky. So I don't think an astronomical event with a planet that's four to eight times the size of Earth would ever be able to be covered up. The amateur community was always much more astute even than the professionals of finding things. Shoemaker Levy 9, Hale-Bopp. So I have, I, have, I have faith. However, that's not to say that there aren't threats from space because as you can guess, this would not be a very good day. So I do put merit in the idea that it is at least acceptable to be aware of what's going on in the solar system. Everyone has their jobs and their family to worry about. And we've seen things like Armageddon or Deep Impact in the media, but the professional community like NASA, they don't give us quite the full picture. When this happened, Shoemaker Levy 9 broke up into nine fragments and and impaled Jupiter with such force, NASA said, it's going to be nothing. Don't even worry about it. Don't look. Nothing. Those little dark spots you see, those are all the sizes. You could fit an Earth in each one of those. So those are huge. And to say that that was an event that you know, we shouldn't be paying attention to, I disagree. And so we have information uh, all throughout history, the idea that you know, large comets and debris maybe took out the dinosaurs, something whacked. The Yucatan Peninsula caused these great you know, devastations. And that would be a pretty uh, dramatic event. Now, if there is a planet X or a Nibiru and it does come into the inner part of our solar system, this being such a large body is going to have comets and debris following it. And that stuff is what we would have to be worried about. That stuff could whack us. And we've seen these things kind of getting on the radar of the public eye for deep impact Armageddon, just kind of opening the idea that, hey, there could be something in our future that you might want to at least have a mental preparation for, like, okay, this is what's going down. So <laughs> there's uh, another interesting uh, research that came out from a professor named Dr. Richard Mueller out of Berkeley, and he theorized nemesis. Now, his research basically pinpoints the idea that we have another 
uh, asteroid belt way far on the fringes of our solar system called the Oort cloud. And that he postulates that there is another failed sun that's orbiting, uh, excuse me, there's another planet orbiting our failed sun. Now, his model predicted that these extinction level events that happen over millions of years, like why the dinosaurs were taken out, were caused by the dislodging of debris and comets by Nemesis that hurl it all towards the inner part of our solar system. Why I think this is interesting, again, now, we didn't know until Hubble and various other imaging, you know, developments that most solar systems that we film out there are binary. They have two suns. So it stands this question that maybe we also have a binary solar system, but our one sun that we now get the heat from is working. The other one is a brown drawer for a failed sun and is no longer working. And so this model suggests the idea that there's another planet nemesis that's orbiting our failed sun and that its pass through the Oort cloud dislodges comets and debris and that cyclically sends things towards us. Now, you know, uh, again, talking about uh, a Nibiru or uh, another planet in our solar system, this too would have effects if there were, you know, debris and comets following it. Here's that actual tablet, the flood tablet stored in the British Museum that tells uh, how a Sumerian man is chosen by um, you know, an Anunnaki to build this craft, and it word for word is a rendition of the English version of a Noah's Ark tale, but it's a Sumerian god choosing a man, Utenpishim, to do this task. And here's another interesting Sumerian tablet where we hear in the, in the English version there were giants upon the earth. Well, here is a Sumerian tablet that you see the Sumerians are standing before one of the Anunnaki and worshiping him, and he's a much larger being. Now, I don't think they were physically larger beings like giants. This is something that's debated. I think they were just more in awe, you know, like, oh, he's, you know, a great, a great reverend, reverend being, you know. Um, so we see all these depictions in the Bible, you know. So where, where are all the Sumerians learning this information and all this information about planets and science and in the Bible, we just have the term that there's these angels that somehow like float down from heaven and we don't really know where heaven is. Every culture around the world says, you know, my, being, my, my God didn't come across the lake, he came from the heavens. So the Sumerians give a very interesting piece of information to that tale by saying that their heaven was Nibiru, meaning their gods came from another planet and had a whole bunch of information. Now in 50 minutes, I can't break it all down for you, but basically some of these pieces are like longevity of life. If you're on a planet that goes around the sun 3,600 of our years, that's still one solar year, a trip around the sun. So let's just say hypothetically Jesus was an Anunnaki, and he came here and said, my people live and prosper. And then he, he disappears for 3,600 years, goes back on Nibiru, comes, comes back. It's been a year for him. It's been 3,600 years on Earth. So there's a whole idea that if you were to go to Nibiru and live on its planetary life cycles, you'd live a much longer life than you could here on Earth. So there's a lot of these overlaps between the information discussed and what's shown in the actual Sumerian texts and tablets that have been, un, excuse me, that have been unchanged. Here's another interesting symbolic reference that I show. It's just a simple Anunnaki, one of the rulers of a spaceport is what they were called. And you can see here he's holding up a little thing here, and he's even got an interesting little device on his wrist. Could be symbolized maybe as a watch. He's holding symbolically here the fruit of life and the water of life. Now the little wrist watch, that's just a coincidence. But if we, look here as a, if we look here at something that is interesting, is that if we look at what the scholars, you know, in the early 1900s, as I said, they were picking out these artifacts and saying, well, what are they doing? Birdmen? This is mythology. We don't understand. Well, look what we're doing today. It's the same thing they were doing then. We didn't land 6,000 years ago, 6,000 years from now, they're not going to look at this and say, what were they doing, putting birds on the moon? We're using a symbolic reference to say we had the power of flight. And it's the same thing that the Sumerians are doing by depicting beings with wings. They didn't have a technological explanation. They didn't understand, you know, science and mathematics and stuff. So they gave everything a spiritual review. Someone floating down on a conveyance of flight, they'd give him wings. He had the power to fly. So a lot of these correlations start to make sense when we see even in our own modern symbology, like the first landing on the moon, and the terms uttered are, Houston, the eagle has landed. It's the same symbolic references that the Sumerians are describing to say the Anunnaki had the power of flight. So I'll just kind of go through some of these tablets to discuss and show this idea of a winged disc and the reverence for this. There's a, there's a man. He's flying some type of a craft. What does this mean? What are they trying to depict? What are they trying to show us? And so a lot of this information would put into a new light to, to accept the idea that maybe we aren't alone and that there are beings that have visited us really starts to raise the question of, well, all this, you know, amassed 
information of science and knowledge that literally comes right out of the Stone Age the Sumerians possess, it does make sense if something, some being more technologically and more spiritually advanced comes here and interacts with us, this is the type of stuff that they're going to, you know, be departing. Now, people always ask where are, like, the spaceships and where are the, you know, the tools and things. Um, and there's just, there's, there's a, you know, a overall higher topic to describe for the, the field of ufology and saying why don't we find any of these things because I'm sure they do exist, but they're quickly snatched up and become classified. So a lot of these things that are in the, in the, in the record of just in the past to look at are there and you can kind of get a general idea for where we've been in the past and kind of get an idea where we might be going in the future. These are just uh, artifacts again, you can see the detail in uh, showing that um, this is one of the Sumerian gods named Ishtar, she liked to fly the skies of earth. And you can just see the detail that they used in describing and creating some of these patterns for a simple culture, it's just, you know, it's very, it's very interesting. So just more cylinder seals kind of showing the symbolic reference for the winged disc and uh, its influences on these various cultures. I like this slide because, again, you see the depiction of an Anunnaki coming down. We're going to kind of wrap this up here. And I think it's interesting here you can see the people holding up the platform for this to take place. I call these the taxpayers. Yeah. Sure. So I'm going to just kind of whip through some of these last slides to kind of uh, wrap it up here in my last 10 minutes. Uh, here's just a more drawn back view of that. This is in Iran and Persopolis. And you can see just the detail that was done by these ancient cultures depicting. Now, why would they go through the effort of doing something like this? Just to make a pretty picture on the wall? It's obviously meant something. So, for my opinion, I can see that the correlation of all these stories being told of the Anunnaki having the power of flight or their, them bequeathing knowledge to them, um, it was very sacred knowledge and it was handed down by priests and only certain scribes, Sumerian scribes, could actually write cuneiform script. So having knowledge of the planets and all this information was very sacred and esoteric knowledge that was kept only with the high priests. Kind of like today in top secret classified information. Hmm. So you can just see kind of the various aspects, uh, you know, and it just kind of raises the question of, you know, they all came down from the heavens, but where is heaven? Is it possible that there is you know, other beings in our solar system. And for me, it starts to make sense when we put science, modern science, to look for using our own astronomical, you know, advances. Let's find the planet out there. If, there, if, if Nibiru does exist, then it's very possible that we do have, you know, ancestors living on that planet. So, okay, I'm going to go ahead and kind of wrap it up there. And, uh, you know, I would, I would offer you to go to xfacts.com or just Google Jason Martell and you'll see there's a plethora of information and you can uh, deep, you know, dive deeply more so in your own time into these topics. Thank you very much. Folks, if you'd like, just real quickly while Tom's setting up, I'll, I'll just take a couple questions if anyone wants to shoot one at me. All right, good. It looks like everyone's going to talk amongst themselves. And All right, good times.
Okay, we'll be starting again in about one minute. Okay. Hey everybody, grab a seat, please. Alright, Okay, go ahead, please. Good morning, everyone. Throughout the uh, history of the solar system, there have been many proposals for uh, additional planets than the ones we know about. And uh, in modern times, there's even a recognition that we don't have a clear definition of a planet. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> hence the dis dis dispute going on now over whether Pluto should be called a planet or not. Uh, officially at this moment, subject to revision when they next meet, the IAU says there are only eight major planets. And Pluto and Eris, which is even larger than Pluto, and uh, Ceres in the main asteroid belt are called dwarf planets now and they're expected to be many more such discovered. So rather than burden uh, future sc school children with learning an indefinite number of planet names, there will only be eight major planets, they say, from now on. Uh, but there have been proposals for additional planets, uh, some of which uh, no longer exist or some of which were hypothetical. Uh, Vulcan was the original name given to the hypothetical planet inside Mercury's orbit. Uh, turned out not to be there. And the explanation of the anomalies that led people to think it was there uh, were, were solved by Einstein when he found that there was a, a natural gravitational effect that perturbed uh, the orbits of the inner planets, especially Mercury. Um, Doppelganger was a hypothetical planet in the same orbit as Earth, but always directly opposite us. So we couldn't see it because it was always hidden behind the sun. Very clever, but in modern times, uh, we could have seen its gravitational perturbations on the other planets, and it wasn't there. And this, we have had spacecraft go out and look. Um, we'll be concentrating today mainly on discussions of uh, planet V and its uh, moons Mars and uh, Bologna, also called body C originally, and on planet X, or Nibiru. Um, and uh, so w without further ado, let me... Uh, make a few general remarks on that. Uh, planet X comes in three, uh, three variations in modern times. There are many proposals that have been made over the years. As Jason said, the uh, origin of X is both uh, the unknown and also the Roman numeral for 10. Um, now, of course, with the new counting system, we're either looking for uh, dwarf, uh, planet number 12 if you count the dwarf planets or planet number 9 if you don't. Um, but uh, in, the, uh, in the Sumerian, uh, in the Akkadian seal that Zachariah Sitchin used uh, to, uh, primarily as the basis for his original proposal, that and a lot of translations of text for which there's no dictionary, um, the, the problem with the interpretation uh, that uh, he placed on this uh, interesting looking seal is that there are too many discrepancies between it and our present solar system. In fact, there's no single unique identifier uh, to which we can hang our hat and say, well, yes, this is clearly uh, a portrayal of a star and planets, and it's our solar system. 
Uh, they're arranged in a circle, whereas the planets are, are not. Uh, there are, there's nothing to correspond with uh, Eris or Pluto. There are no rings or moons to identify. Uh, Saturn, for example, its, it's most spectacular feature is its rings. Uh, Jupiter has major moons. Uh, the, the relative sizes are wrong, um, uh, and so on. There's a long list of these things that have been published. And uh, if, it's attempt, uh, if it is an attempt to portray a real star and planetary system, uh, I'd have to conclude it's most probably somebody else's star and planetary system. If, if the uh, legends about Nibiru uh, have any factual basis, then uh, they would have to be from another uh, stellar system. <laughs> Um, the, uh, th there's also uh, a Planet X uh, that's been proposed by psychics, people who um, uh, are allegedly in, in touch with extraterrestrials who have gi uh, uh, given them this information. Um, but there's a common problem both with um, the psychic Planet X and with, the, uh, with Sitchin's Planet X, and that's this 3,600-year uh, uh, orbit uh, that, that's been proposed. Um, I'd sort of like to give you a flavor of why such an orbit is unstable. Um, you first have to realize that most of the planets uh, move in ellipt uh, elliptical orbits, but if you stood back a distance, they're only slightly elliptical. Uh, uh, they're very nearly circular orbits. Uh, not so with um, Comets or, uh, or these uh, hypothetical outer planets, uh, um, planet X, uh, the orbits are extremely elongated and pencil thin. And as a result, they're unstable. Uh, co when comet Hale-Bopp came into the solar system, just as an example, um, it didn't uh, pass particularly close to any of the planets, uh, but the, uh, as it goes by and the planets are in random directions uh, as it moves into the planetary region, it gets a tug first one way from one planet and then another way from another planet and so on. So the orbit is constantly changing. And with a pencil-thin orbit, that has a major effect on the period. So when comet Hale-Bopp first came in, in and was discovered, uh, it had an orbital period of 4,200 years. That is, it had been 4,200 years since the last time it came by. But after the planets tugged it this way and that, uh, it rounded the sun and went out on an uh, orbit with a period of 2,400 years. Uh, and that was a random change, but by a huge amount. Uh, the, very often, uh, almost half the time when long period comets come into the uh, planetary region for the first time. Their orbital, orbital periods are changed so much that they're thrust out into space never to return. Um, so uh, 3,600 years is not a, a stable period. Uh, you might hit that number purely by accident for one trip, but the next time around it's got to be completely different. Uh, and uh, so, so on for the, uh, the other objections that are summarized on the slide here. Uh, then there's the astronomers planet X, and uh, astronomers uh, such as uh, my, my late colleague Dr. Robert Harrington um, have long felt that there was something wrong in the outer solar system because uh, when we observe the motions of bodies out there, both planets and spacecraft and comets, there seem to be tugs this way and that that can't be explained by the, the bodies we know about. Well, uh, originally when we began the search for Planet X, we estimated the probability at, at 80 percent that the explanation was an undiscovered major planet. I'd have to place that probability today at well below 10 percent. Uh, it's not that we um, uh, were wrong about the idea, it's just that what we found instead of another uh, planet was uh, two uh, huge new belts of asteroids which we now think are remnants of planets that exploded, just as the main belt is apparently the remnants um, uh, in the outer main belt of uh, hypothetical planet K that exploded a uh, quarter of a billion years ago, and uh, uh, planet V 65 million years ago. Well, uh, beyond, um, beyond Neptune, there are apparently planets T and pla planet X, all hypothetical, of course, uh, both of which exploded and left belts of asteroids, which is what we've 
been finding out there. And very probably, uh, once we get enough data, the perturbations from these asteroids will account for the uh, remaining anomalies. Uh, and we think, therefore, that uh, there, there is no, uh, since there have been many, many searches, we think there's no major planet left to be discovered uh, that the, uh, it, it, it was there long ago, probably a billion years ago, uh, but is now orbiting the sun in pieces that are the asteroids and um, former moons like Pluto and Eris uh, and other, some of the other larger uh, dwarf planets that are found out there. Uh, this leads us to look into the question of how planets form in the first place and uh, how they end. And uh, there's a lot of new evidence lately that it suggests that the end of planets um, is in the form of explosions. Uh, not the kind we need to worry about. Uh, we live on a planet too, and when I say that, uh, there's immediate level of concern. Uh, but we're talking about things uh, uh, that occur at uh, hundreds of millions or billions of year intervals. And uh, we knew the Earth wasn't going to last forever, and uh, it's probably uh, has a it's pr probably has a, a a date when its warranty runs out too, but <laughs> but uh, not uh, not in the lifetime probably of uh, uh, of any of the species currently on the planet uh, and and their posterity. Uh, but in the standard mo uh, model, uh, the solar system formed from a large cloud of gas and dust. But there are all kinds of problems with the standard model and. Uh, there are many technical papers now discussing these problems. And there's an alternative model which is working much better for us. Uh, there you see a, a brief graphic of the fission model. Uh, any gaseous body such as the sun or even the, uh, the giant uh, gas planets um, would, uh, as it spins uh, and contracts under the force of gravity, it spins up and like an uh, ice sk skater spinning. If you pull in your arms, you spin faster. If you put them out, you spin slower. Um, a contracting uh, star or planet will uh, spin faster and faster until the centrifugal force trying to make things fly off the spinning surface is stronger than gravity and it fissions and you create planets in usually in twin pairs. So that's the fission model and then tidal forces of all things outward uh, to where they are today. Um, there, there's a brief summary of the fission model and the key points. Uh, it means planets and moons uh, tend to occur in twin pairs. Uh, when we look at uh, the planets in the solar system today, interestingly, they also seem to occur in, in twin pairs, except for the things that had previously been known to be probable exceptions. For example, uh, the aforementioned uh, by me and by Jason, uh, Robert Harrington uh, um, and I co-wrote um, papers that were published in the astronomical literature uh, 30 years ago about Mercury uh, probably being an escape moon of Venus. Uh, Mercury and Venus uh, ori started originally very similar to uh, the Earth's moon and Earth. Uh, but Mercury was, uh, had raised larger tidal forces on Venus and its orbit evolved faster and it was able to escape into a planetary orbit. We went through the whole set of dynamics on that. Um, Mars apparently also uh, was not an original planet, but was a moon of a planet that exploded, planet V. And Pluto and its moon Charon apparently were w one time separate moons of Neptune and escaped uh, again on, uh, under uh, the influence of a large uh, body that c came close by. That might have been uh, the end of the, uh, the former planet T uh, when it made a close approach to um, to Neptune and underwent so, uh, sufficiently strong tidal stresses that that caused it to blow up. Uh, now let's concentrate a little bit on planet V uh, because there's a lot of, uh, of current interest in that uh, subject because of what we're finding out uh, with all the spacecraft that are visiting Mars currently. Uh, planet V uh, is not the one in the middle of the main asteroid belt um, that has been proposed as the origin of the main belt asteroids, but rather it was originally in the orbit uh, now occupied by Mars. Uh, and we think that planet V had t uh, twin moons, Mars and Bologna. 
uh, that planet V exploded 65 million years ago um, through natural processes and uh, that explosion produced damage throughout the solar system. On Earth we see it as what's called by the geologists the KT boundary. Uh, to us, uh, it, let's see, I think I, the, the next, let me, whoops. Uh, let me back up one. Uh, yes, uh, there's an overview of the KT boundary events. That's when the dinosaurs were done in. Uh, it was a global event. There are uh, now 16 known craters associated with that uh, date. There were hot zones of radioactivity, a major episode of volcanism uh, that spread over a wide area on Earth, changes in the uh, air and the ocean, a single global fire, if you can imagine that. Uh, a lot of damage here on Earth from an explosion as far away as uh, the orbit of Mars. Um, uh, there, uh, there's a lot of evidence for this event uh, on Mars, the survi surviving body today. Uh, most strikingly of all um, is that uh, Mars is like two planets, two, two hemispheres glued together because on one side it is saturated with craters and on the other side it's flat and smooth and uh, there, there there's, there've been many efforts to explain this uh, this dichotomy, as it's called, uh, uh, why is one side of Mars so different than the other? Well, if Mars is originally a moon, keeping the same face toward its parent planet, just as our moon keeps the same face toward Earth, and all the major moons in the solar system keep the same face toward their parent planets, uh, then, of course, if the parent planet explodes, what happens? You can only crater and blast one side of the moon. The other side is facing away, and uh, there's no damage, or little damage. Also, the pole tipped over suddenly by 90 degrees, a major episode of volcanism. Much of the atmosphere was blown away. Uh, there are uh, elements in the atmosphere that uh, indicate a, a, a massive explosion occurred. They don't occur uh, through natural processes, and so on. Um, and there, there's also evidence for a major flood event probably with the explosion of the moon later on. Now, uh, people ask why planets explode. That's kind of off uh, topic for today. Um, but let's just say uh, there's now a, a pretty good theory involving uh, gravitational processes that explains uh, why they explode. And uh, there's something else interesting about the subject of gravity that relates to the subjects of interest to this uh, entire uh, symposium which is that we've discovered, uh, well, shall we say recognized in the last 15 years, uh, that gravity is a natural force that propagates much faster than uh, the speed of light. And uh, previously that was thought to be a physical impossibility, but we now know that uh, that isn't the case, that the, uh, the old idea that there is a universal speed limit is now uh, off the books, and uh, gravity apparently is an example of something uh, that violates that limit because it propagates much faster than light. And the importance of that for um, the whole subject of ufology is it means that uh, communicating with light and radio signals um, uh, at the speed of light is not going to do it. Uh, the SETI program isn't going to work and uh, you can't expect uh, intelligent species to be using communication signals that are so slow that it takes years to get to the nearest star and uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of years to get signals across the galaxy. Uh, they would be using gravitational signals once they perfected that technology, in which case you could still communicate within seconds or minutes uh, across uh, these huge distances. Uh, so uh, the fact that, the, uh, that both uh, faster than light communication and travel are now possible in physics is an important development and changes a lot of our thinking about um, uh, who could be here and uh, why they are, aren't visible and so on. Um, let's see, there's a, another summary again of uh, the evidence that Mars 
It was a former moon uh, and uh, a, sh a graphic of the dichotomy showing that uh, one, uh, one side is uh, uh, heavily cratered and the other not, and uh, also a thicker crust. And that uh, when the other moon exploded 3.2 million years ago, it produced a major flood on, on Mars. Uh, here are the two hemispheres of Mars in um, spacecraft close-up views of the entire hemisphere. Uh, again, you can see the saturation with craters here. And this, the blue areas are not oceans. They're just flat, smooth areas where there's, there's essentially uh, nothing in the way of cratering. Uh, no large craters survive. There are lots of small ones. This uh, video uh, it gives a brief overview uh, of what we've learned about Mars in the, in the last 10 years and what we now think it means in terms of reconstruction of the violent history of Mars. Uh, let's see. How are we doing on sound? See if that works. Name has grown out of war. Could that be heard? New research shows of a now exploded parent planet. Indeed, evidence exists of six planet explosions throughout the history of our solar system. The most recent planetary explosion took place almost 65 million years ago. Its impact on distant Earth killed the dinosaurs and 70% of all species. But Mars was much, much closer. Somewhere near the present day orbit of Mars, Planet V, a helium class gas giant and parent of two large moons, Mars and Body C. Body C is a watery world. It's smaller and the outermost of the two twin moons. Mars is larger, drier, with a tighter orbit. Core evolution eventually leads to the collapse of planet V, triggered when tidal forces from the moons and sun are at their strongest. Suddenly, an explosion. The surface of the moons facing planet B are blasted as debris from the explosion expands throughout the solar system. The atmosphere of Mars is dramatically altered forever. These two moons enter eccentric orbits around each other for the next 62 million years. Tidal stresses gradually build in body C until 3.2 million years ago when another collapse becomes imminent. Again, debris, including water from body C, slams into the surface of Mars. Most of the water sublimates into the cold vacuum of space. The rest is absorbed into the Martian surface. Some of that water and carbon dioxide freezes to form ice caps at the Martian poles. Mars also captures two small asteroidal moons, Phobos and Deimos. Over 20 features of Mars as seen today are a testament to this history. Surface evidence shows that there were two separate major pole shifts in Martian history. The southern half of Mars is saturated with impact craters, while the northern half is smooth flat and relatively crater-free. Major surface volcanoes, once violently active, now lie dormant. The cratered surface has a crust that is up to 20 kilometers thick near the middle, tapering near its boundary, while the smooth surface crust is a steady one kilometer thick for most of its hemisphere. A one-time major flood event, with no evidence source, modified the surface extensively 
Highland craters without flow channels have no viable sources for water from either atmosphere or soil. For more background information and additional evidence, or to subscribe to Meta Research, please visit our website at www.metaresearch.org. Okay, uh, that's the uh, that's the overview vi video. It does a nice job of summarizing the the picture. Um, uh, of course, you have to consult the published articles on this to see uh, the full plethora of evidence and how it stands up to the criticisms. Um, this uh, this is the transition to uh, the Mars anomalies part of the of the topic because those tie right into this picture, which is why I gave that background and also to our uh, efforts to currently understand what's going on today in the solar system with the activity of intelligences, past and present. Uh, this is a picture taken by one of the Opportunity rovers on the surface of Mars. And uh, the, uh, the uh, tracks made in the surface there were made by a rover, uh, uh, an Opportunity rover, as it passed by. And as it w passed by, some liquid filled in uh, the tracks and froze, and uh, it's, uh, it's as you see it there. Um, this, this happened uh, several years ago, and there are many pictures like this, including pictures of the rovers with muddy wheels and so on. Uh, you wondered why um, NASA waited until just a couple of weeks ago to announce the discovery of water on Mars when the water had been discovered on Mars probably a, a dozen or more times previously, dating all the way back to the early 80s, uh, and was officially announced by the European Space Agency uh, three years ago. Uh, but NASA didn't recognize any of those uh, discoveries and kept arguing, well, it could be carbon dioxide ice. There's no evidence that it's water. And uh, interestingly enough, there is no um, experiment on either spirit or opportunity which could detect water directly. They are there only to detect uh, minerals that could have been modified by water billions of years ago. Reason for that is simple. Uh, jobs and money. Um, the space, uh, the, the approved missions in the space program uh, held off the discovery of water on Mars according to advanced planning until the Phoenix mission that just landed a few weeks ago, or last month. Uh, so if it had been uh, recognized any sooner, the main point of that mission would have been undercut. Uh, likewise, with many of the other findings, uh, so, uh, both, um, uh, both the U.S. spacecraft in 1976 uh, and more recently the European uh, spacecraft have found strong evidence of microorganisms, living microorganisms, in the soil of Mars today. But they don't dare announce that or recognize it uh, either right now because then the justification for the next six missions would be undercut and it would be back to the drawing board. So uh, uh, our, our NASA approval, a stamp of approval, will be slow in coming uh, according to the, uh, the schedule that, that's been doled out. Remember, it's, um, I know there's a lot of talk in these conferences about conspiracies. You could call it a conspiracy if you wanted to, but really it boils down to money and jobs. They're humans like everybody else, and if you put a lifetime of work in on building an instrument for a spacecraft and then find that the mission is canceled because somebody uh, beat you to the discovery, it's, it's a devastating thing. So uh, this is the way the space pro program as it's presently organized works. Here's an example of a couple of fossils seen by uh, uh, the, the Opportunity spacecraft. Uh, we won't have same kind of comment. No, not officially recognized yet as anything. Um, when we look at the surface of Mars uh, from the orbit, we see all kinds of uh, interesting things. And about one in every thousand photographs returned uh, to Earth has shown something of such high interest that if we didn't know, that if it wasn't published on a NASA website and we didn't know it came from Mars, uh, we would be pretty sure that the pictures had been taken on Earth. And I'll show you some examples of why in a moment. 
in this, uh, this is a low resolution photograph of an area with a couple of large craters, as you see. And this white box that's drawn in here on top of the photograph, uh, that's a region where the spacecraft took a very high resolution view so we could see close up what was there. And what they were interested in seeing was what's this dark stain on the floor of the crater? And so when we look, uh, switch to the high resolution view, um, we'll see that it starts here, uh, the spacecraft flies over empty desert sand, then it comes to the edge of the crater, and we see the shadow uh, on the wall of the edge of the crater. We see a bit of the normal floor uh, of the crater, and then we come to the dark stain. So let's, uh, let's follow the spacecraft. Okay, there's the, uh, an overview of the, uh, of the strip image it took. And now let's look at that magnified. It starts out over the desert, flat and smooth, not too much of interest. Then we come up to the edge of the crater. We see the shadow on the wall at the edge. We see a flat, smooth floor, and then we see the dark stain. Um, we, we don't know uh, what this is, <laughs> but it does change with the seasons and with the <laughs> and even with the time of the day uh, as the sunlight uh, changes its direction and so on. Um, so it's one of many, many things uh, that we'd like to know more about, but probably won't know officially for many years. This also is something uh, something on Mars. I'm tempted to say growing, but uh, <laughs> we don't know that. <laughs> Um, the, this is an area, the color is, uh, coloration is added here uh, on Earth, uh, but we see these large uh, objects with a um, branch-like structure around a central trunk area. This is a couple hundred meters across in the very low gravity field of Mars. There are many such pictures, and again, they do change with the seasons, and as the picture suggests, uh, the European spacecraft, which does have uh, colors, shows that they green up in the summer. <laughs> uh, that was one of Arthur C. Clarke's, uh, the, uh, the late uh, um, science fiction authors, one of his favorites. He said uh, he, think, he thought we, uh, we'd been short-sighted and that it was 95% certain that um, Mars is more hospitable to life uh, than previously thought. Uh, this is another kind of anomaly that we're seeing on the red planet um, called glassy tubes. Here's an overview picture of what was seen uh, in high resolution. There seem to be three of these tubes coming together here, and this is a high res uh, a clip, a magnified view of just this one tube, uh, showing that uh, what is characteristic of all of them, uh, they seem to have a translucent uh, tube material surrounded by these white bands that wrap around and around. Uh, and you can see through, uh, in, in good high resolution views, you can see that the bands do wrap and you can see them faintly through the translucent tube. You also see this white spot here, which apparently is a specular reflection of sunlight, indicating a very shiny or possibly metallic uh, surface, but uh, a high gloss surface unlike the d diffuse or scattered kind of uh, reflection you get off normal material. Here, here th uh, this shows the very glassy character of uh, these tubes. Uh, this one shows um, uh, the uh, famous region on Mars called Cydonia, where we have the so-called face on Mars. I'll have a few remarks uh, about that later. Um, there's also a little feature over here called the, the fort. These are just names given to things. We don't know for sure what they are, um, but uh, out of the back, or the, shall we say, the right side as we look at it here, um, of the, uh, the fort feature, feature, there's this dark impression in the ground, and it turns out that's a glassy tube coming out of the, the fort, uh, which we can see here in this greatly magnified view of just that portion, the back wall of the fort and that that dark uh, object there. We see that it's actually a glassy tube coming out of the fort which disappears below the surface uh, a short distance out. 
Well, with some of the new um, infrared and uh, ground penetrating radar techniques, we can now trace that uh, uh, underground as long as it doesn't go too deep. Uh, and that produced some interesting results. Um, this is a, an infrared, which means it's a heat view of the same images. So this is what the face over here looks like in infrared, where we're sensing only the heat, not the light. And this is the fort. Um, and we can see uh, in infrared that the tube traces its way right down to the next mesa. So it goes from one to the other. And in better views than we can see here, there's another branch that goes off and <laughs> connects with this one. So th that's, the, uh, that's art added by me. But just to sh show you what it is we're seeing there. Uh, so the point of this is that in this and many other cases, the tubes are not random, but they connect interesting surface features. Here's another example. There's a, a, net, uh, a, a, um, uh, a crevice, shall we say, that stretches for hundreds of kilometers across the surface from way above what we can see here to far below and to the left of what we see here. And here is a high resolution view uh, of a part of that crevice seen over here, and we see that at that particular junction uh, of where the crevice comes down and goes off to the left and where a branch of it goes off into the crater and then seems to go around the crater, uh, just at that junction we see uh, glassy tubes. And um, wouldn't that be interesting if uh, that were uh, some, wh whatever it is, uh, to go in and then wrap around the rim of the crater uh, is certainly interesting behavior. Uh, here's a case of uh, a nest of glassy tubes. Uh, one of the main points of this is that here we have a, an example of one glassy, one tube with uh, horizontal stripes crossing over another with vertical stripes, and we can see the vertical ones plainly through the horizontal ones, indicating, of course, that they, uh, they do cross one another, but they're translucent. Uh, the light does pass through them. Uh, here's an interesting case of a tube where a boulder has come in and smashed it. And what happens when the, uh, when the tube breaks? Well, we see that the white bands are very, uh, very pointed and spindly, may possibly, uh, you know, giving the impression of sharp and needle-like. And um, this is lying flat on the ground. And there are exactly two of these for every one of these because be, uh, since it's lying flat on the ground, you get the, uh, the underside as well as the top side uh, that's uh, visible to the eye. So uh, when you break a tube and flatten it on the ground, that's what it looks like. And the same thing has happened down here. This is a flattened portion of the tube uh, from this rock. But this is an intact portion. And there you see the transition between the two. Um, we see that in many of these ca in any cases, the tubes have right angle junctions and uh, network. And uh, here's a case where there's some sort of a terminus where many tubes from different directions come together. Um, we don't know uh, what the glassy tubes are, but we certainly would like to know more. <laughs> this is an artist concept, anything with coloration added uh, to these uh, uh, images from Mars Global Surveyor has to be an artist concept. Uh, but that's what, what uh, uh, the imagination might lead us to if we just looked at all the evidence and said, uh, what, what could this be? Because we can rule out the major geological theories, lava tubes and sand dunes and so on that have been proposed. Um, this is the first of a set of interesting type of objects uh, that have uh, shapes on Mars. And of course, uh, there are lots, uh, lots of shapes that occur, can occur in clouds and in nature. But these particular shapes are all taken from one particular narrow region uh, on Mars called Cydonia. And Cydonia is where also the famous face on Mars is located. And it seems to have a clustering of these shapes. And, uh, it draws our attention for uh, several reasons. One is that it's a nest of shapes that look uh, in many ways familiar. Um, but 
Uh, so they're clustered in one area, and secondly, they have relationships to one another so that the ones that you would associate with aquatic features, uh, such as this one, uh, are in one region uh, of Cydonia, and uh, things that fly are in another region, and things that are uh, mammals are in another region, and so on, um, such as this. Uh, so what's the point there? Well, here, here's one of those um, high-resolution strip images uh, taken by a spacecraft. And we were starting to notice that things are organized and that many of the um, aquatic-like shapes, such as the one I showed here that looks sort of like a seahorse, and this one that sort of looks like a fish or possibly a swordfish, and this looks like a a uh, hermit crab shell. Uh, it, one's imagination can run wild, but um, this is a darker area and gets darker as you go down, and things that are also aquatic in character are adjacent to it on both sides. Say They may agree and they may disagree, or they may agree to disagree. We don't know, so for the first time we're gonna we're gonna listen to what they have to say. But if you've come here with preformed opinions, you're not going to get much out of this. So I want you to, to take some time and be very open-minded. Nobody is here to insult anybody's theories or destroy the fact if somebody says UFOs don't exist, then that's their opinion. Uh, now, we're going to have uh, pairs of speakers. We were, going, we were originally going to have three, but unfortunately one came down with a medical problem uh, from Australia, so there's only going to be two pairs. So, uh, did you all receive your uh, program changes? Okay, so uh, my good friend uh, Horace Drew, uh, the geneticist from Australia, won't be making it, and unfortunately Bill Burns uh, won't be here. But we have uh, two individuals to uh, take their place, and uh, what they're going to say is going to be very uh, illuminating. Now, I, I want to make an announcement uh, that um, Vicki uh, Jack, Victoria Jack, is here. Are you in the room, Vicki, yet? Okay, not yet. All right, she, she is here at the conference, and Victoria puts on the uh, super uh, spectacular San Francisco Bay Area UFO Expo uh, every year, and this year the dates will be September the 27th and 28th. And, uh, you know, if you make a, a reservation in advance, if you live in the Bay Area or not in the Bay Area, it uh, gets pretty packed. I believe there was 1,500 people there last year. So she puts on a, an excellent conference. Uh, I'll be there uh, as a speaker. <laughs> Thank you. And, um, <laughs> and uh, I, won't, I won't have to be, uh, you know, dedicating the time that uh, I have uh, put in this one. I'm not the conference organizer. I'm not responsible for anything except getting the speakers here and the program. So if you see me running around here trying to... Uh Perfect. Okay. Thank you for coming to my lecture. Today I'm going to be discussing, as Roger eloquently put it, Planet X. And what I'm going to be focusing on is also some of the ancient connections through biblical ties to ancient languages and texts and artifacts that also tie in the idea that there could be another large body in our solar system which has some pretty interesting effects, not only on our planetary orbits, but possible other civilizations or beings that could be influencing our societies that are in our own solar system. So what I'm going to do is kind of start off with some of the modern research for a term that's called the search for Planet X. Now, this is kind of a modern term, Planet X, symbolically meaning X unknown, but 10 also beyond Pluto, the next planet out there found. And there's been a plethora of research over the last decade for the idea of another body in our solar system beyond Pluto and research to suggest that we should still be looking out there beyond for another planet that does exist. So there has been uh, a massive amount of research that's been done over the last, let's say, 20 years that kind of suggests the idea that there is another body in our solar system. This is a diagram that's actually from an Encyclopedia Britannica and it shows uh, from in the early 80s they actually had plotted that there's a dead star, a failed sun, way out in the solar system. And I'll get to that in a minute, the idea that our solar systems could possibly be binary. But here it is in even a, in a 1983 
uh, diagram that shows that the orbit of our sun could also incorporate another failed sun that has a planet orbiting around it. Let me grab my laser. Okay, this way I can point things out to you guys on the screen here. So this would be the idea of they're saying that there's another sun out there that, that exists. And so all throughout the modern research in the last 10 years, we've had things coming up uh, in the news or new types of uh, instrumentation being launched into space, uh, infrared equipment, things that can penetrate the cold veils of space and do fine tuning to get a better idea of what's out there. A lot of the satellites that they've released over the last few years have a very interesting uh, help with technical problems, of which I know absolutely nothing about. Uh, it's just because I, you know, I uh, I want to lend a hand. Now, uh, another uh, thing that I have to ask of you, if you will, uh, you're perfectly free to uh, take pictures and uh, record whatever you want, except. During the time Dr. John Alexander is going to be talking, please don't have any recording equipment of any kind. No video recording, no audio recording. We're going to be looking around the audience during the time that he's seeing, and uh, if we see somebody trying to record, unfortunately we're going to have to uh, remove that person and take the recorder and get it back when you... Uh, when this lecture is over, but I'm asking you to do that in, in deference for Dr. Alexander uh, because he has uh, quite a history and believe me, there's reasons for everything that happens uh, here today. So uh, we'll get uh, right into it. Uh, our first two uh, speakers are basically going to uh, talk on the subject of uh, Planet X. And we have uh, Mr. Jason Martell here. Uh, who has been uh, talking about the Planet X uh, for some time, as a matter of fact, 15 years. Uh, Jason is one of the leading researchers and lecturers uh, specializing in ancient civilization technologies. Uh, Mr. Martell's research has been uh, featured worldwide on numerous television and radio networks, such as the Discovery Channel, History Channel, Sci-Fi, BBC, and many others. Uh, most recently, uh, Mr. Martell garnered worldwide attention by recreating a working uh, model of one of science's most prolific mysteries, the Baghdad Battery, which you probably know about. Residing, uh, this resides in the uh, National Museum in Iraq. The discovery of this 2,000-year-old device suggests that modern-day battery was not invented in 1800 by Count Alessandro Volt, but was invented almost two centuries earlier. Uh, Mr. Martell's recreation was instrumental in proving the Baghdad battery was capable of generating current. Uh, lecturing throughout the world, Mr. Martell has dedicated his studies to ancient artifacts and the Sumerian culture by using the latest in scientific research, supporting evidence and data. He corroborates his findings with principal scholars such as Zachariah Sitchin, naval astronomer Dr. Robert Harrington. Uh, Mr. Martell holds regular discussions with NASA scientists on the subject of Planet X, ancient astronauts, and structures on Mars. Uh, there's um, great uh, evidence uh, that has shown that uh, in our solar system, uh, the planet uh, Nibiru uh, passes through our uh, solar system. And uh, I think that uh, if you listen to what he has to say uh, and you know a little about this subject or you know a lot about it, you're going to be very well informed. And uh, with uh, uh, Jason, we're going to have Dr. Tom Van Flanderen, who is a worldwide known astronomer. And uh, Tom received his Ph.D. degree in astronomy specializing in celestial mechanics, the theory of orbits from Yale University in 1969. He spent 21 years uh, at the U.S. Naval Observatory in Washington, D.C., where he became the chief of Celestial Mechanics Branch of the Nautical Almanac Office. During the uh, past deca decade, Tom has been a research associate at the University of Maryland Physics Department in College Park, Maryland. 
and is a consultant uh, to the Army Research Laboratory in uh, Delphi, Maryland, working on improving the accuracy of the global positioning system. And, you know, everybody that drives a car now knows what a global positioning system is. He and his wife moved to uh, Seguin, Seguin, I guess that's the way you pronounce it, in 2005 to be near their children and grandchildren, enjoy the, uh, enjoying the beauty of the Pacific Northwest. In uh, 1991, Tom helped form an astronomy research organization, uh, Meta Research, uh, to foster inquiry into worthy ideas otherwise supported solely because they conflict with mainstream theories in astronomy. Among the organization's significant contributions are evidence against the Big Bang Theory and a better theory for the origin and nature of the universe, experimental evidence that gravity propagates much faster than light, and a new model for the origin and nature of gravity itself. The prediction of asteroid and comet satellites years before their discovery, new evidence favoring the exploded planet hypothesis, and new models for the origin of asteroids, comets, and the solar system. Strong hints that certain anomalies seen on Mars are not natural origin. So uh, we've got two uh, really uh, fantastic speakers here, and uh, I, I've let the, the paired speakers uh, kind of choose their own way that they're going to do this. So what's going to happen is that the, the first speaker, who is going to be uh, Jason Martell, is going to talk for 50 minutes. And then Tom will come up and talk to 50 minutes. That will leave 20 minutes in which they'll both be up here together to do whatever it is they want to do. Throw bananas at each other or answer questions or run out the door. So uh, now uh, it gives me great, great pleasure to introduce my very dear friend, Jason Martell. Let's put your hands together. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, give me a second here to flip on my laptop. I was joking around earlier, I said I call my PC my personal computer. Okay, looks like I'm good. Hopefully my little clicker here is going to cooperate as well. 